why is health care not a right in the United States? Um, you know, back in the 19, I believe it was the, the, the 1940s, I, no, no, I, it was probably the 1950s, um, the United Nations, in fact, it had to be a little after that. Anyhow, the United Nations negotiated this agreement that pretty much every country in the world except the United States signed, at the, the United Nations Convention on Human Rights, that says health care is a right. And every other developed country in the world, except the United States, acknowledges that health care is a right and not a privilege. And that's a really important distinction, because when something is defined or recognized by a government as a right, that means that if people don't have access to it, the government has an obligation to provide it. For example, education. We have decided in the United States that education is a right. Everyone has a right to a decent education. And that's why if, you, if your school is providing your kids, you or your kids, with a substandard education, you have, the, you have the basis actually for a lawsuit because you have a right to good education. In every other country, every other developed country in the world, health care is a right. And different governments have figured out different ways to deliver this to everybody. They basically fall into, into three buckets. Uh, but not the United States. We have not dis defined this as a right. Those three buckets, by the way, are the American system, which is mostly you know, privatized and for-profit health insurance, the socialized medicine system, which is basically the United Kingdom's National Health Service, and the, vet and the VA hospitals in the United States. And the third is single-payer health care, which is what we have in the United States with Medicare for all, with, with Medicare, if we, what we would have if we had Medicare for all, and what other countries have with their single-payer systems. So why is it that we never said in the United States health care is a right? Turns out this goes back to the 1880s. In 1884, Germany got their first single-payer health care system. Uh, Bism Otto von Bismarck, this is when Germany, this is even before the German Republic. This is when Germ Germany was an empire. And the head of the German empire, Otto von Bismarck, pushed through a single-payer health care system because he said it would keep the populace and the army healthy, lowest expense to the public purse. In other words, it's the best way to do it. And he was... He was right. That same decade, a guy named Frederick Ludwig Hoffman uh, left Germany at the age of 17 with five bucks in his pocket and came to the United States as an immigrant. And uh, he, he was a, a, a real, uh, what's the word, savant. He was a mathematical savant. This guy with numbers was, he could do magic with numbers. And he ended up having a job, getting a job with a Prudential Life Insurance Company, which at the time was the largest insurance company in the United States. And he was running numbers for them to figure out how much to charge people for their life insurance policies. And he's the guy, Frederick Kaufman, he's the guy who figured out that there's an association between smoking cigarettes and getting lung cancer, between uh, being exposed to asbestos and getting mesothelioma, the disease that killed my father, and between uh, working in cotton mills and getting fibrosis of the lungs, and also between eating a diet high in processed foods and getting a, a variety of types of cancer. In fact, his book on diet and cancer is still in print here in, 19, in 2021, even though he died in 1946. So anyhow, he, he, he directed his numerical work toward the so-called race problem, because Prudential at that time and other life insurance companies were trying to figure out how much to charge for their policies. Originally, they just didn't want to cover black people at all. But then, you know, as, as a market developed, as some black prosperity was emerging um, in, in parts of the United States, the, you know, the insurance companies were like, OK, what do we charge? And so Hoffman ran the numbers. And sure enough, black people were dying at higher rates than white people. And they were getting sick at higher rates than white people. Now, you and I today in 2021 know that that all has Thing called systemic racism, but that wasn't even a phrase back in the 1890s. And so Frederick Hoffman wrote this book based on his math, based on his research, titled Race, Tendency, Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro. He published this in 1896, the same year Plessy versus Ferguson turned America legally and officially into an apartheid nation with, uh, you know, separate but equal. And in his book, Race Traits, Frederick Hoffman uh, a pointed out that blacks were dying and getting sick, you know, at higher numbers than whites. 
but then made a couple of logical leaps that he believed the evidence, the numeric evidence, uh, you know, supported, but now we know historically is just nonsense. The first was that this was because, the reason why black people were dying at higher rates and getting sick at higher rates, was because they were genetically inferior to white people. In fact, he went so far as to say that during slavery, black people were healthy and happy. His phrase. But post-slavery, without the white person to protect them, the, uh, the black race, his phrase, um, uh, began to essentially disintegrate. So which led him to his second hypothesis, which is, was in his book, Race Traits in 1896, which was that if white people who control the politics and most of the economy of the United States simply deny health care to black people, the black race, begin his phrase, would die out in two or three generations. And that would, quote, solve the race problem in America. Frederick Hoffman took this theory, pitched it to Congress, uh, gave lectures all across the United States to state legislatures, met with governors, um, uh, to physicians groups. He was, he was uh, uh, beloved by those establishments. He, by the way, he was the co-founder of the American Lung Association. I mean, the guy was no, no uh, uh, slouch. He was, he was powerful, he was famous, and people took him seriously. Woodrow Wilson, well, well, and, and this is why in 1912, when Teddy Roosevelt proposed a single-payer health care system to cover everybody with, as part of his square deal plan when he was running for president for, for you know, re-election, this was why that got shot down. Because white people, including the medical establishment, white people by and large said, particularly the white racists in the South, said, wait a minute, if you cover everybody with health insurance, you're going to be covering black people too, and we can't have that. So that ended that discussion in 1912. It's also what, why they came after Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 when he proposed a single-payer system. It's why they came after Harry Truman in 1947 when he proposed a single-payer health care system. But black people, we can't do that. Black people will get that health care. Uh, you know, and, and this is why they came after John Kennedy in 1961 when he proposed a single-payer health care system. And it's why when Lyndon Johnson and Robert Ball were writing, writing the Medicare law in, the, in 1965, the southern racist conservative senators came to them and said, you need to build into this thing a bar high enough that poor black people in the south, and 60% of black people live in the south right now. It was even a higher proportion back then in the 1960s. So the poor pe black people in the South won't be able to jump over that bar and show up in our all-white hospitals. So they took Medicare Part B, which is the part that pays for hospitalization, and said, we're only going to pay for 80% of the hospitalization. There'll be a 20% gap, which is the gap that you fill in with your Medigap policy now. That gap was to prevent black people from pre presenting themselves in hospitals unless it was just a, an absolute screaming life-ending emergency. So from the beginning through the 1960s, the reason why the United States never acknowledged health care as a right rather than a privilege was because of Hoffman's theories and white racism. I mean, they were just like intertwined. And American racism, I don't know how else to say it. And that prevailed right up until the 1980s, that, that kind of thinking and that kind of opposition to any kind of health care program that might help black people as well, particularly poor black people, as well as white people. It's why to this day, 12 former slave states have refused to extricate from Texas to Florida. It, goes, it all goes back to, to Frederick Hoffman, which takes us to stage two, which is, you know, why the uh, health care companies or, you know, why it is that we have not been able since the 1960s or the 70s or the 80s, really it's since the 1980s, why we have not been able to overcome that opposition 